I want to um, welcome you to the Florida Friendly Landscaping Professional Webinar Series. Today's webinar is Underutilized Natives with Dr. Sandy Wilson. She'll provide an overview of attractive and functional ornamental um, native species that are underutilized in our, our landscapes. This webinar is approved for one FNGLA, Florida Water Star, LAIF, DBPR, um, Landscape Architecture, and FDAC CEU. There is a $10 administration fee to receive a certificate of continuing education. And I'll put that link in the chat box to make payment for the certificate um, if you haven't already done that. And um, this is part of a monthly webinar series held on the second Tuesday of the month at 10 a.m. Our next webinar is an overview of the FFL certification programs available. And um, just so you know, your microphones have been muted, um, but please put any questions you have in the chat box and we'll be sure to take them at the end of the presentation. I would also like to announce that now is the time to submit your landscape projects for our Florida Friendly Landscaping Award. This award program is held every um, other year to recognize projects and people who are making a difference in Florida's environment. Um, there are award categories for education and also um, projects for professionals and homeowners. Um, so if your home, community, your project qualifies as Florida Friendly, this is a great opportunity to highlight your achievement. Um, the winners will be showcased on the FFL website and social media platforms. Um, so please consider submitting an application by November 21st. I'll also put that link in the chat box um, for you to, to, to look at the, um, the application process. It's pretty simple and straightforward. You'll also see a survey invitation pop up. So please take a moment to fill this out at the end of this webinar. It really helps us determine what educational programs to offer. And we're currently looking at next year's lineup. So it's a great time for your input. And um, with that, I will turn this over to Tom Wickman to introduce today's speaker. Thanks, Claire. I'm Tom Wickman. I'm the statewide coordinator for the Green Industries Best Management Practices Program, all part of Florida Friendly. And it's my pleasure today to be, in, to be able to introduce uh, my friend and uh, an amazing speaker, Dr. Sandy Wilson. Uh, Dr. Wilson is a professor in the Department of Environmental Horticulture at the University of Florida. Her research focuses on characterizing the invasive potential of ornamental plants and native plant propagation and production. She teaches courses in plant propagation, native landscaping, and annual and perennial gardening. Throughout her career, she has been recognized uh, with numerous prestigious awards recognizing her excellence as an educator. Most recently, she co-authored the world standard textbook, Hartman and Kessler's Plant Propagation, Principles, Practices, Ninth Edition. For her outstanding contributions to horticultural science and education, she holds the distinction of fellow within the International Plant Propagator Society, the American Society for Horticultural Science, and the North American College, Colleges and Teaching of Agriculture. Today, Dr. Wilson is going to present underutilized Florida natives with proven performance. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to turn the floor over to Dr. Sandy Wilson. Take it away, Sandy. All right. I am, good morning. I am so happy to be here with all of you and just wanted to take this opportunity to thank Claire and Emily behind the scenes and Tom for that great introduction. The Florida Friendly Landscaping Program has such a um, tremendous, talented team. And I'm always happy to be able to speak at um, any of their webinars. So good morning. We're going to have some fun today and learn a lot about some um, natives that I've picked out to talk about. And I do have a 60%, 40% uh, teaching appointment. I wanted to put my website on the, um, right here under this picture. And um, in case you have any other questions about some of the classes I teach or some of the research publications and things that uh, we're doing in our lab right now, all that information can be found there. This is a picture actually of one of my classes, Florida Native Landscaping, where the students all grew their own pollinator plant. Today, um, as I said, we are going to have some fun learning about some native plants. And 
Most of you in the audience probably have heard of the value that natives can bring to our landscapes. It sort of makes sense because they were here at the time of European contact. So they've been, they've been, um, they've been able to withstand the different climate conditions and temperature and rainfall patterns. And ultimately, they can be very drought tolerant once established and may require less fertilizer, less pesticides, less inputs and also provide food and shelter for our wildlife. Another great benefit of natives is that they can be a alternative to ornamental invasives. And um, they just really help increase the bio biodiversity in landscapes and gardens. And there are many benefits to having ornamental plant diversity in any landscape. So this can include genetic diversity where we use seed propagated uh, plants, but also this includes using a diverse number of different ornamental species that can offer year round ecosystem services and functions. And so we can accomplish this by using plants that are of different sizes, that have different flower and fruiting times, that have different types of plant architecture and also varying leaf persistence. And to illustrate, this is a picture of Pan's Gardens in Palm Beach, Florida. In the dead of the winter, you can see that some of the trees are completely deciduous. And these, this garden is still very visually appealing and also very functional in every season of the year. So you might ask yourself with all of these great advantages uh, of native plants, why do we see predominantly non-native landscapes? In Florida, we have, um, we have almost 3,300 different native plant species and only a, a less than a quarter of those are, are actually in cultivation. Our newest uh, Florida Association of Native Nurseries catalog only lists 52 native plant wholesalers. And this, um, the sales of these natives only represents a very small fraction, 15 and percent of our nursery sales. And what's happening or the situation in Florida is consistent with what's happening on a larger scale in the United States. So I see this as a critical need to increase our native plant palette. And I like to do this by what I call the three, the four P's, propagation, production, performance, and promotion so that we can make research-based recommendations and hopefully see more natives being used in landscapes and this becoming the new norm. So what I'd like to do today is in the next series of slides, share with you some of what I call the native celebrities that I think are just fantastic. They're celebrities because they're proven performers. They're uh, very ornamental. They're adaptable to different landscapes and they all offer more than just beauty. They also, um, offer varying ecological services. So this first celebrity is called Conradina canescens or false rosemary. It's also sometimes called scrub mint. And Conradina honors Solomon Conrad. He was an American botanist. And canescens, the specific epithet, comes from the fact that the if you look at the foliage of this plant, the leaves are a grayish, kind of whitish, like a gray green, I call it. And, um, and canescence is a Latin term for that. So this is an evergreen perennial. It has a mounding habit. And um, the leaves are very fragrant when crushed. This is a, a member of our Lamiaceae family. And um, 
And the flowers, as you can see here, all of these nice purple flowers are uh, what we call bilabia. They're two lipped, so they have two little petals um, to the on one side of the flower and then three petals on the other side. And, um, and they have a very long flowering period. So the flowering usually starts sometime in the spring and flowers, they're, they're still flowering right now in my garden. And, um, and I like this plant because it, it only will reach about two to three feet um, in height and, and width. And it does like full sun and uh, it prefers a well-drained soil, but it is somewhat adaptable to different landscape conditions and has um, great drought tolerance. I have this in an area of my landscape uh, without irrigation and, um, and also some salt tolerance. So to get a better understanding of where this plant naturally occurs, this figure on the top here is um, the, all of the different counties in Florida. And the green counties are highlighted because we have herbarium specimens of that plant uh, that was documented in a natural area. So I like to use these maps because it can give us an understanding of cold hardiness, um, sometimes um, whether or not the plant is a coastal species or not. And, um, and it also can give us an idea of maybe if the plant is threatened or um, endemic. So the um, native range of this, as you can see here, is the Western Panhandle. It's also native to Alabama and Mississippi. And I like to use this plant in uh, pollinator gardens. Um, I like to use it in herb gardens. It's suitable for rock gardens. It can be used in mass plantings, like as borders or also as a specimen. And it is excellent because it is a bee magnet and um, also contributes to the beach mouse habitat and um, attracts many other different kinds of pollinators. So this is one of six Conradina species in Florida, and it's the only species that is not listed as endangered or threatened right now. This is a picture of the Conradina in uh, my garden. I just have one of them mixed in with a perennial bed. This is the Tradescancia ohioensis, um, a white form of it. Our next celebrity is Garbiria heterophylla. And this is an incredibly overlooked native that is only available at a few nurseries. So I'm helping, I'm hoping to change that. Garbiria honors the botanist Abraham Garber. And heterophylla refers to the fact that the, that the leaves, as you can see here, have diverse shapes to them. So this is a mounding evergreen shrub. It, uh, it will get woody and it does perennialize. And the leaves are, are kind of also that grayish green color, which I think provides interest in the garden. And the top or the apex of the leaves, as you can see here, are more wide and rounded. And we call that obovate. So that's characteristic to, um, to to this species. And then the this is the fruit. This is uh, an akeen and it's it has um, it is wind dispersed here. And quite frankly, I find that very attractive as well. Again, this plant will like full sun. It's very drought tolerant. It prefers well-drained soil um, and it is adaptable in the landscape. You can look at the map here of Florida and see it's kind of native more to the north central peninsula um, of scrub and xeric hammocks. And, um, and I like to use this also as a pollinator species. And also um, I like to even a single species I'll use as an accent plant just to give a pop of that lavender color into a garden. It's a great plant as a nectar source for butterflies. And, um, and this species is actually state threatened. 
we have 20 different bee species that are documented visiting the species. Okay, so our next superstar is Hibiscus grandiflorus. Now, some of you might be interested or might be familiar with the, the other hibiscus, the um, scarlet hibiscus as native to Florida, but this is different because um, it has these beautiful pink petals and, um, and a different type of foliage. So the translation of this is hibiscus is just the Greek word for mallow and grandiflorus refers to its large, uh, flower, as you can see here. The leaves are heavily uh, tomentose, and that's just a word for heavily pubescent, and that gives them this grayish, um, greenish kind of color. And the leaves are also what we call undulate, meaning that they're wavy. So if you flatten a leaf on a surface, you can kind of see waves along the margin. And the flowers have, um, the flowers are trumpet shaped and have these persistent, um, what we call sepals that are just kind of modified leaves. And also they have these, um, they have these involucrate bracts that, that kind of look like little um, hairs. And that's characteristic of, um, of this genus. And then the flowers are followed by these beautiful capsules and um, in the early fall, you'll start to see them fruiting. This plant will reach uh, five to 10 feet tall. You can plant it in full sun or part shade, and it does tolerate moist to wet soils as the common name would indicate, but it is very adaptable. I am trialing this at different places in the gardens, and um, I have it right now in an area that does not have irrigation and I only have to irrigate it under periods of severe drought. So I think this uh, plant can do well in a number of different landscape settings. It is native to Southwest, uh, Southeast, um, uh, in the Southeast and also um, to Texas, as you can see in the map here and pretty much to the entire state of Florida. And um, we actually have eight hibiscus that are native in Florida, but only three of them in, are in production. And you can see, get a sense for the, the foliage in that picture there. So the, the, the fruit has just finished um, opening, and then these are all the seeds in the fruit, and you can propagate these yourself. So this makes a great gift to give to others. Our next native celebrity is Hypericum tenuifolium, or also called Atlantic St. John's wort. And you might have heard of St. John's wort because it's used in medicinal, um, for medicinal properties. But we have 30 different uh, St. John worts in Florida. And of those 30, only a handful of them, less than a handful of them are commercially available. I like this one because it has the widest distribution in Florida and is um, available by at least a few nurseries and um, has done really well in the gardens. So hyper means above and econ as, uh, means a picture. And they used to put sprigs of this above pictures to ward off evil. And that's where the genus comes from. Tenuifolium refers to the slender. You can kind of see the leaves right here. They're linear and very small. And this is a small shrub, as you can see here. It's decumbent, which means that the stems will lay flat and then they'll, they'll um, become vertical. So it lends itself to that nature. And um, the flowers are just wonderful. They're five petaled yellow flowers and all of these are stamens. So it's multiple, multiple has, uh, it's multi-staminate, which gives it kind of um, uh, a, a nice appearance. And, um, and you can find this flowering usually in the summer. And um, 
It's very drought tolerant, just like the others I've talked about, and uh, also will like full sun. Well-drained soils is um, preferable, but it is adaptable. So you can see it's a natural distribution in Florida. It's more of a sand hill or scrub species. And also um, north to North Carolina and west of Mississippi. And that gives us an idea of its cold tolerance. And um, this one could be used maybe as group plantings or even as a specimen plant. It is definitely uh, useful in bee gardens. And there's, um, there's a weeping kind of form of this called Mount Kilimanjaro. And um, you can see what it looks like when you're comparing it um, to the left species. A much different habit. Our next species is Psychotria tenuifolia or soft leaf wild coffee. And I, to, to put a pun on words, I am psyched about Psychotria. We, in Florida, we have several different Psychotria species. I love all of them. And um, a year or two ago, I talked about the other Psychotria species, but today I want to highlight this one. Psychotria is a Greek word for to give life because of its medicinal value. And um, this one is called soft leaf wild coffee because the leaves have this pubescence to them. It's again, kind of a grayish green. And um, the flowers, as you can see here, are uh, attractive to bees. And also they're very, very fragrant. This is a plant that's very overlooked because um, it has so much to offer to a garden and yet is underutilized. So it can tolerate part sun to full shade. It can even tolerate full sun if you give it provided irrigation, but really it's happiest in uh, part shade. And it's tolerant of moist soils, but adaptable to dry soils. I have these in areas, two different areas in my garden that don't receive irrigation. And uh, I only need to irrigate during periods of drought. So you can see here its distribution in Florida. It's a hammock species and um, also native to Mexico and um, different areas of uh, Central America. And I like to use this in mass plantings or I'll mass plant it by uh, combining it with the other Psychotria species. This makes a fantastic cut flower, uh, both for the foliage I'll use for arrangements and also for the flowers. And it's a great species for shade gardens. And um, as I mentioned, it attracts uh, many different bees, birds and other pollinators. So just to give you an example, this is uh, Psychotria tenuifolia. This is the uh, Psychotria nervosa or the shiny leaf wild coffee. And then this is the Bahama wild coffee that's native uh, just to South Florida. And you can kind of see a difference in the leaf, the leaf color and also the uh, flowers. Our next proven performer and celebrity is Pillowblepis rigida or Florida Pennyroyal. And this is a, a plant that um, really catches my eye in the winter time because it's flowering when a lot of other things are not flowering. Pillow is a Greek word for hairy and blepis means eyelid. And if you look at the sepals that are located below the petals, they're hairy, they have pubescence. And that's where the genus comes from. And then rigida just stands for um, rigid or referring to the stiff branches. So this is a very low growing, maybe one foot to one and a half feet tall um, perennial. And um, 
I like it because it, it is in the Lamiaceae family. So the foliage is fragrant and it has these uh, beautiful lavender flowers and um, is great for an area that receives full sun. It likes, um, prefers well-drained soils and um, will do very well even without uh, supplemental irrigation. So this is a species that's native to scrub and pine flatwoods, sand hills, and even dry prairies of most of the peninsula of Florida and then also in the southern Georgia. And um, you can kind of tuck this in in a number of different landscape settings. If you have a rock garden, you can kind of tuck that in there or an herb garden or a mixed wildflower garden. It could be used as a crown cover. And so there's a lot of different uses for this plant. Um, and it serves in many ways, not only is it uh, beautiful, but it also attracts, it's a great nectar source for attracting um, and serving butterflies and bees. And, and this plant is extra special because it's the only species in its genus. So in the um, old days, they used to make, um, the, this species is edible, they used it in teas, and also um, the oils were used as an insect repellent. I included this next plant in our list because I feel sometimes when we say um, oak, we think of tree. And Florida has 25 different oak species that are native to it, natural hybrids. Of these, only about 17 of them are in production. And, um, and some of them are shrubs and not trees. And Quercus myrtifolia is one of these examples. So myrtifolia refers to its myrtle-like leaves, as you can see in the picture here. And, um, and this is a plant that has, you can see the acorns here, typical of the oaks, but its height is up to somewhere up to maybe 15 to 20 feet tall, depending on where you plant it. That's um, variable. You can see a, a single plant, we plant it in the teaching gardens here. Um, it likes full sun, will tolerate part shade, and um, is very, very drought and salt tolerant. So you can see it has a very nice distribution in Florida and is also native from South Carolina west to Mississippi. And uh, this can be used as a screening plant. Uh, a plant for uh, wildlife benefit, and it's also used coastally for dune stabilization. The Florida scrub jay also heavily uses this species. Our next native superstar is Verbicina virginica, also called crown beard or frost weed. And this species found its way into my garden, probably through one of the other native plants that I had purchased and uh, flowered and really stole my heart because it's very underutilized. Um, it definitely needs the right place in the landscape because of its height. So verbicina refers to um, the, the fact that it resembles verbena. It's in the aster family, so it's not in the same family as verbena, but uh, virginica refers to one of the states it's native to. And this is a very erect, tall, herbaceous perennial with, um, that is winter deciduous and um, provides, it, it flowers in the fall and also um, through Usually through late fall is when it's, um, it's just starting to flower right now. And, um, and you can see here, I just love this plant because it has these beautiful, attractive um, ray and also disc petals. And, um, and it can be used, you can plant this in uh, full sun or also part shade. And this is very adaptable. It can be grown in dry conditions without irrigation where it will tend to stay, um, not grow as tall. And um, if you have moist areas, it will do well there also, but it will get taller. 
So this is a native to hammocks and pine rocklands throughout Florida and also Eastern and Central United States. So this has got great cold hardiness and, um, and is versatile in the landscape. You just need to kind of put it in the back of a perennial garden and um, because of its height. And, um, and you can see one of the features of this is the, the stems are winged. And, um, and that is just very interesting. And it's also good uh, shelter for different um, insects. So this is a good nectar source. So this is what it will look like on the left here is it in the spring. And then uh, later in the summer, it starts to grow more vertical and then flowers kind of terminally. And um, so that gives you an idea of its height. This is a great species for um, if you want to achieve kind of a woodsy appearance. This is it um, along with some sable palmettos and the native helianthus. Our next superstar or celebrity is Nymphoxylum figuera or wild lime. It gets its common name not because it produces lime-like fruit, but because it is in the citrus family. And as you can see here, it has these compound citrus-like leaves that have this winged rachis. Xanthos means yellow and xylem means wood. So that's where the genus comes from, Xanthoxylum. And then Figuera refers to um, another genus that's in the citrus family. I like this uh, plant because it's a small tree. It fills kind of that niche as a small tree, maybe reaching 20 feet tall or less. And um, the flowers are fragrant, they're yellow, and they're born in the leaf axils here. And when it's flowering, it's very, very attractive. And underneath the, um, the leaves are uh, spines and they're curved a little bit. And this is, makes it a fantastic plant for pollinators because it can protect, or, or for wildlife, because it can protect them. And um, this is a plant that likes full sun, but it will tolerate part shade and is very drought tolerant with moderate salt tolerance. You can see it's a natural distribution in Florida. It's a hammock species, but also can be found in uh, Texas. And um, it's a larval host plant for three of our swallowtail species. There's others in Thoxalum species that are native to Florida, but they're not ornamentally as valued as this one or available. So this kind of shows you a progression. Um, the, the flower buds will stay closed for a long period of time and then they'll bust open. And then uh, these are all the different flowers along the stems. And then eventually the fruit will develop and you can collect these and, and germinate the seeds. We think this species is so fantastic that it is the subject of this graduate student you see here, Lindsay McKell, who is working on propagating the species by seed, by uh, cuttings when seeds are not available, and also in tissue culture. I'll be giving a talk to a different audience, a webinar, in December, and I'll be talking about the specifics of how we can propagate some of these native species. Okay, so um, I know that I've run, I've run kind of fast through those species, and but I wanted to, I had to make a decision whether or not I cover a lot of species in a short amount of time, or whether I include uh, a more limited number of species and, and cover them at more in depth. Um, so um, 
So I hope that you will look those up and, um, and learn more about them on that website that I gave you. Now, before I go, I did want to, you are the first to, you're probably among the first to hear about some other exciting things that we have going on here. The first one is the new Florida Friendly Landscaping Gardens B mobile application. So if you do not already have this on your phones, then you can, um, you can go to this website here. Well, it's the, the URL, and then you can save it to your mobile device. And um, this contains approximately 100 different plant species that attract 12 different major bee groups. So you can use this app to learn not only which plants you can place in your landscape to attract um, bee pollinators, but also you can learn about the different, the different aspects of these bee groups. And um, this kind of follows the same principle as the Florida Friendly uh, Butterfly Garden app that you probably already have and also the Florida Friendly app. And now we designed one specific to bees. So uh, go down there and um, find that and you can get all kinds of tips for how to design your bee garden, how to select different plants to attract different bees um, and different planting and maintenance guidelines as well. Uh, that is, is newly launched. The other most exciting thing that just came out, uh, literally, let's see, today's the 12th. I think it's coming out on Friday. It will be in the bookstores on Friday. If you go to this um, URL, that's where you can find this. And this is a guide, we, we call it Plant This, Not That, led by Tina McIntyre and um, Rachel Gunter, Morgan Pinkerton. And this is a, um, they're kind of like uh, flashcards where you can learn how to avoid invasive plant species and what to plant instead. So this covers mostly native alternatives and some um, non-native cultivars based on some of the research that we've done. So be on the lookout for plant this, not that. So today, I hope that you, I have um, inspired your interest in native landscaping, and um, maybe you'll look for a native plant sale in your area, wherever you are, and, um, and um, buy some native plants, put them in your garden, and see how well they do for you. This is a stand of Helianthus and Gustafolius, which is flowering, peak flowering right now. And uh, I didn't include it in my talk because I had too many other plants for my talk, but, um, but I have this kind of low area in my garden and, um, and I put that in the center without irrigation and, um, and it does really well and is just um, a, a bloomer in the fall when, um, when a lot of the other yellow natives are blooming. So that's another nice native for your landscape. Again, this is my website here. If uh, you're interested in any of my programming, you could go there and uh, spend days going through the different materials that we have posted. With that, Tom, I think I've finished in time to take some of your great questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Sandy. Um, I, I've been frantically taking notes because, you know, you always teach me so much great stuff. And um, I, I, you know, I asked you before the session started whether you had any new favorites, and um, I learned a whole bunch. So I'm, I'm really excited to uh, try and add a few of these to my landscape. Um, but we do have some questions that came in. Um, one of them is, uh, do we include cultivars as natives? Oh, <laughs> sorry. Such a great question. Such a great question. Okay. So the, um, 
if you if you go to the uh, Florida Association of Native Nurseries website, it's fan.org. Um, they have a list of all of the different uh, native plants that are available, and they only will list a cultivar if it's a native cultivar, which means that it wasn't made by man. It was a, a naturally occurring, um, um, naturally occurring form that has been uh, selected and propagated. And so, um, so there's been a lot of research and publications, including some of my own, that have looked at comparing native cultivars with non-native cultivars or comparing uh, a native species with a non-native uh, species that shares the same genus. And, and the results really are, are dependent on which species that you're looking at. So there's been a lot of research that shows that some native cultivars can be as attractive to pollinators and serve the same ecosystem services as the non-natives. But there's been other research that has studied how many different types of pollinators um, come to these plants. And those studies have shown that uh, it's better to go with the um, native forms and, um, and to avoid the cultivars. So uh, from a landscape architect opinion, it's sometimes very, very challenging to find these plants um, in nurseries that, um, that aren't cultivated forms of these plants. So to, um, if you're looking for um, pure, I'll say, call them pure natives, um, your best bet is to go to a native plant nursery because they, um, they propagate species that are within their region and they typically will collect seeds locally and you can ensure that you're, um, that you're using like local seed sources and uh, materials that that's not uh, a cultivar. Great question. Fantastic. Thank you, Sandy. Um, how long does false rosemary live? Okay, um, so false rosemary, I've had it, it's going on five years right now since we've had it in the garden. So maybe it uh, isn't long term, but, um, but it will propagate by seed. And also you can propagate it by cuttings if the seed isn't available. So, um, so it's definitely kind of in that short-term perennial category unless it reseeds. Okay, great. Is uh, soft leaf wild coffee poisonous to livestock? Oh, um, so I don't know. That's a question I don't know the answer to. I am not sure if it's poisonous to livestock. Uh, I hope that it's not. It's not poisonous to birds because they carry it all over the place and digest it. And um, so I'm not sure. My guess would be no, but I, I'm not 100% sure on that. I'm not either, to be quite honest. So um, it's a great question. Um, is there a native plant that is similar to sweet almond bush, something that's very fragrant, kind of like the sweet almond bush? Oh, yes, yes. I have wished that the sweet almond bush was native because I like that so much and I would just love to be able to highlight it amongst my favorite natives because it is one of my favorite non-natives. So um, yes, um, and it is an incredible um, bee magnet. It's, it's one of the species listed on our, our uh, Florida Friendly Bee Gardens app. So, um, so for that species, um, gosh, it's hard. It's, uh, we have like, we have the, the sweet acacia, which is very fragrant, like the almond bush and attracts bees, but it can't really be, it doesn't grow in the sim similar habit as, as that we have the, um, but it is very fragrant and, um, probably as far as fragrance and flowering time, 
that that would be kind of your your best bet. Okay, super. Does Myrtle Oak sucker? Yes, Myrtle Oak, <laughs> Myrtle Oak does sucker, but uh, it depends on where you plant it and how you care for it. Because uh, in the teaching gardens, which is 100% non irrigated, it hasn't started suckering at all. So usually, um, you know, some of the plants that I covered today, if you plant them outside of their of, of their happy zone, I'll call it, uh, sometimes they won't grow, you know, to that robustness or they won't sucker to that same magnitude. They'll kind of stay in, in uh, where they were planted more. And that could or could, could not be beneficial. If you have it in an area that you don't mind suckering, like our native uh, viburnum suckers pretty pretty well. And um, so it can be an advantageous if, if you want it to kind of fill in an area and form that thicket, or um, it can be a disadvantage and you would have to cut those suckers off. So yes, it does, it does grow that way. Uh, the one in the teaching gardens has not started um, at all. It's still in the, the primary um, stems that it began with several years ago. Okay, super. Can uh, myrtle oak uh, be grown as a standard? Have you ever seen that? Oh, yes. I love these. I'm happy that we have these questions of myrtle oak because I feel that sometimes um, species get overlooked because they don't have the show or showy flowers or, you know, the wow factor, yet they're very important to um, our ecosystems. And uh, yes, it can be grown as a specimen and that's actually how I have it in the gardens. Super. Um, this person has a very high pH area, 9.0. Um, any suggestions for natives that will grow in very alkaline conditions like that? Oh, man. Oh, that is a high pH. Um, so you would, you would, gosh, that is a really high pH. Um, so your best bet is to, um, to sometimes I would try to teach to think about the ecosystem a plant is native to. So if you think of high pH ecosystems, then um, you could look for species, um, you know, that are native to that environment. And sometimes that's a really good way to figure out where to put it in your landscape. I do that a lot with the reverse where I have some acid loving um, plants and they're native to more like pineland ecosystems that have more acidic soils. So I know that those plants might do well in more acidic conditions. The, um, I find that the, the, the more basic conditions, especially in nine is uh, always a little bit of a harder challenge. Awesome. But that's your best, that's your best bet for that. Okay. What is that? The name of the tall yellowing, fl yellow flowering plant in uh, in that slide that's uh, ah, is up right thank now. Thank you. That's Helianthus angustifolius, and it's called um, it's called swamp swamp sunflower because it's native to like swampland areas. But I planted it in this example without irrigation, but it's in a lower like depressed area in the landscape. So I'm kind of um, tricking the plant <laughs> to thinking um, that it's planted where it wants to be. It's certainly putting on a show. It is putting on a show. Um, do you assess natives for resilience? Yes. Um, so part of our uh, research program, it's the, um, the production and also the performance evaluation. And, um, and so for, we look for, we look for natives in their natural areas 
that we think have ornamental value and then we bring them in and figure out how to propagate them. And then if we can work out an efficient propagation system, then we'll trial them in um, always three different areas in Florida. And uh, we'll collect data on their performance, which would follow through to their resilience. And that is um, just looking to see how they do over time. So those studies, unfortunately, are usually only uh, one to two years at best because the graduate student uh, graduates and long ter term resilience then is carried over into our gardens. So uh, yes, that's a, a important aspect of trial evaluation. Okay, is uh, wild lime okay to plant? Uh, it'll vector citrus greening, uh, but there are many ornamental landscape plants that also vector it. So, you know, what are your thoughts on, on that issue? Yes, um, gosh, Tom, this is a great <laughs> audience. We, we have, have a great today. audience. They're definitely. asking, um, they're asking very relevant and important questions. And um, yes, wild lime is um, perfectly okay to plant. It's in a, a different genus than citrus. It's in the same family, but it's in a different genus. And, um, and it's okay. We have it at the Florida Natural History Museum naturally. And we have it in many different landscapes um, in the area. So um, get your wild lime and uh, you won't be, you won't be, um, you will be surprised by um, all of its features it will bring to your garden. Terrific. Um, do you have a recommendation for a rapid native ground cover, uh, something to replace turf? Okay. Oh, so a whole nother project we're working on um, is replacements for turf. We're looking at um, mixing native species in with the turf and we call those mixed plots. And um, that's, that'll be a whole nother, uh, a whole nother webinar. But, um, but yes, we, we think that that's very important to do. And, um, and we're looking at, um, we're looking essentially at things that already grow intermixed in turf. So we're looking at Tradescantia, uh, Ruelia caroliniensis. Um, there's a Salvia micella that is shade tolerant that is a ground cover. We're looking at um, just a whole bunch of different species that naturally grow within turf systems. Uh, Salvia lyrata. Um, and some of the Coreopsis species, all of that we're, um, we're assessing. But, um, but if you want to, if you're looking for something to 100% replace the turf, that's a little bit harder to do. And um, to, to have a 100% native ground cover, the salvia micella actually will, um, actually will form, perform as a ground cover. It um, and can tolerate some foot traffic, but um, definitely not the same level as a turf grass system would. Yeah, it's, so stay uh, tuned. Yeah. Stay tuned for that research because um, that's actually a multi-institutional with Ohio, Cornell, and some other people that were looking at that on a big level to try to um, find alternatives to turf. Awesome. Uh, you know, that's that's exciting research and I can't wait to see, uh, you know, years uh, after a couple of years, uh, what kind of data you come up with. Um, can you recommend a native replacement of the non of a non native hibiscus something to use in a dry area. Um, well, I have the for the for the hibiscus that I talked about, I actually have that in two areas that are not irrigated. And, um, and it has done surprisingly well. I have it in three areas actually that are not irrigated. And it comes back every year and um, hasn't showed any signs of, of um, you know, it, it not performing well. So, um, so I would recommend either of the hibiscus, the scarlet hibiscus, or the um, swamp hibiscus. Okay. 
a tougher one. Um, a native plant to replace cast iron, something I guess for a very shade, uh, shady area. Oh, wow. Um, well, for shade areas, I don't, I don't know if there's a plant that can replace cast iron. Uh, if there is, I haven't, um, I haven't found it, but um, it certainly, you know, doesn't have a cast iron look, but some of the shade, some of the overlooked shade additions that are native is we do have a, a native peperomia that is um, has beautiful foliage. It looks good year round. It's more of a ground cover, but tolerates shade. And um, we also have native ferns that tolerate shade that require no care at all. I have them completely not irrigated. And um, you probably figured it out by now that I don't have irrigation in my uh, I, in my yard, so everything has to be adaptable. And so um, those are two that I never worry about. I never have to check on, and th they always do well in shady uh, locations. Fantastic! Yeah, you know, ferns are one of the things that came to mind for me. Uh, and that's that's kind of I have them growing along with my cast iron plants. So um, seems like that would be a, a, a good replacement. Um, can you recommend a native plant? Let's see, I already did that one. Sorry about that. You mentioned two salt tolerant natives of all the natives, which are the best for a marine environment? OK, so um, would that be like so that would be like um, the the spray salt spray or I would think or, so or salt water I'm not sure if it's they, salt they water don't or say, salt spray they're but, not more um, specific okay so I I will give you a great reference for that um, so there's very few publications that actually list salt tolerance as wind tolerance and salt tolerance as water you know, salt water tolerance. And um, for this person, if you go to, um, it's called uh, Natives for Your Neighborhood. If you just Google Natives for Your Neighborhood, that is a tremendous um, resource for species that, and it shows you can search it, whether it's salt tolerant or not. And, um, and then that will show if they're looking for salt tolerance or, or, um, or salt water tolerance. But, um, but I use that resource um, all of the time. Fantastic. Sandy, you have made it through all the questions. So we put you through the gauntlet um, and you shared so much great information. Um, I really appreciate all you've done today. Um, thank you to the audience for um, paying attention, providing such great questions. Um, do make sure to uh, join us uh, next month, November 9th, um, that's 10 a.m. Eastern Time for the FFL Certification Programs presentation. And uh, Sandy, again, thank you for a, an incredible presentation. I've got to come get some cuttings. <laughs> thank you, Tom. Um, if, if the um, audience goes to my website, there's actually a longer list of native plants and their tolerance to the different conditions that the audience question, um, asked. And, um, and they can see much more natives than what was introduced today. Fantastic. Sandy, have a great day. Bye everyone, thank you. All right. That was awesome, Sandy. Thank you very much. Thank you. You Sandy. never know, um, like on the other side um, of like who the audience is like, because you can't, the problem with, um, oh, some more coming in. We're, we're, oh, okay. Are we, we're still recording? Yeah, we're still live. Oh, okay. Yeah, you never know um, when, um, because you can't see the audience to gauge like their um, kind of, you know, what did they think of this species?